Welcome to VMworld 2021, top five end user challenges and how Control Up can help you solve them. Boom. Uh, but you know what's not an end user challenge or shouldn't be? Um, Tom, did I hear you right that we are going to microwave a laptop today? You know, about three days ago, my boss's boss sent me this low end laptop and it's been giving me nothing but fits for the past four days and you know i i say let's 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 nuke it <laughs> okay <laughs> well you know before we do i, I want to try it because you know apparently microwaves they block uh you know the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum which is where wi-fi operates off of so before you nuke it can we can we test it <laughs> yeah yep yeah, yep yeah, we can definitely test it but, but i mean it's it's out of here it's it, it Nothing but fits for the past two days. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. All right. So let's begin. But before we get going, a little introduction about Control Up. People might might not be aware of us. We're uh, we're we monitor two point one billion virtual machines. Um, we have over what sixteen hundred customers now. We work with. All the major players, Microsoft, work virtual desktops, physical desktops, NVIDIA. We monitor those GPUs and those virtual desktops. Those GPUs are so dang expensive, and we need to use them as efficiently as possible. Of course, we're great partners with VMware for the last year and a half. Uh, you've been able to buy our product on VMware Paper, makes the the purchase of us just a little bit uh, less uh, friction in there. And um, we do neat things with other vendors like iGel. Um, with that said, you know, let, let, let's get in and talk about some of these end user challenges. We went out and had a survey, talked to people, you know, what's their big challenges? What are they seeing out there? And number one was log on duration. People just, they don't like sitting there waiting for their log on to, uh, to happen. Um, networking from home issues, like we mentioned at the top of this session, is we got people <laughs> using whatever whatever commodity hardware they have and have been using. I, I know I kind of, I don't have a three-year hardware re re uh, refresh cycle. When my network dies, that's when I replace it. I don't don't have the, the latest technology there. I'll, I'll be the first to admit it. And, you know, times this by, like you said, instead of the three offices where we needed to be concerned about their enterprise grade networking equipment. Now we got to worry about these 30,000 offices with, you know, who knows what they have there. Um, uh, Unified communication is another, another big pain point, right? Teams, Zoom, all of these applications where, you're now streaming a desktop, your video, your audio, and it's getting offloaded either onto the server where it's doing the processing, or you can offload it back to the endpoint where you're now freeing up server resources. And making sure that you have a uni uh, optimized unified communications platform is very important. And we can offer some solutions there as well. Yeah. Um, and then final, finally, slow sessions, you know, just things aren't going right. And I think you have a really neat demo that you're going to show how we can actually manipulate the, the CPU um, cycles and, and make sure people get what they need on that. You're, you're gonna do that demo today, aren't you? I, I'm gonna do several, yes, absolutely. All right, great. So let's go ahead and dive right in, do some demos. Um, by the way, the screen that you're looking at now is, is a really neat feature, Remote DX, that we are gonna demonstrate a little bit, bit later and it, really cool stuff. But I'm going to go ahead and um, bring up Solve. This is our, our real-time console. It's web-based, so you can access it from, from anywhere you're at. Um, and one of the things I like about Control Up is it doesn't just monitor the connection server. It doesn't just monitor the hypervisor. It doesn't just monitor the virtual desktop. What we can do is we can get all that information combined onto one, one screen, and then you can dig in and really find the problem. Because, you know, have you, Trent, have you ever had a problem that was just, you know, one issue? No, they're all interrelated, right? That's right. Yeah. And so, like I said, we're looking at the, the console here. Um, this is our Pacific Northwest lab. It's a little bit small. We have five hosts, uh, 29 VMs running. You can see that at the top here. It gives you a good overview of what's going on. We do have these nice 
a graphic so you can you know point at something and it tells you uh, let me get in there it, it tells you about the the health of your systems uh, machines these are virtual machines um, for the most part and it just you know gives you an overview of that it looks like uh, have a few few in the red zone so probably want to take a look at that um, sessions these are virtual machines that actually have an active user on them uh, and then we can go through from there and see things like uh, top CPU consumers, the average log on duration. Like we said, this is something that really can get you. So we show that up front. Uh, but what I like to do is I like to go up here and bring up a topography view of it. it gives you a good outline in the top, um, whether your host, machines, data stores, uh, all this great information. Um, we uh, not only do virtual desktops, we also do um, RDS, we do farms as well. Uh, and right off the bat, I can see that something is not going right here. It's under my machines and I have a machine that is in a critical state. Um, it looks like its CPU is just slammed. You can click on this historical report CPU. And yeah, it is like at 100% uh, for, let me go ahead and change to 72 hours. Um, yeah, so it's been at 100% for quite a while. I'm going to do a pop out view. Um, and let's even see if it's been going on for a month. Yeah, so right around August 1st, something bad happened. And it's seeing 100% CPU utilization. So this probably isn't something that we, we uh, like, and um, we have these nice little uh, navigation, quick navigations. And what this is going to do is going to take me to the machines sessions. And we have a user, uh, VUser01, um, that is on this session, 94% CPU utilization. We have this stress indicator. And what this does is it picks up uh, key performance uh, metrics, combines them up, and then creates this uh, stress level. So in this case, it's heavily stressed because of the CPU utilization. We also take into account things like log on duration, takes this guy 94 seconds to, to uh, log on. Um, and we can go ahead and just click this uh, quick navigation screen. It's going to take me to the processes in that session. And you know, like I said, this gives you uh, introspection into the yeah, con connection server, the hypervisor, and the virtual machine itself. And it sure looks like uh, what's consuming these uh, VLC resources, uh, these, these CPU resources is VLC. I know that's a video player, so I don't know what he's doing, but it's, it's probably not a good thing uh, to have happen. So, Trent, were you, uh, were you counting how many clicks it took me to to discover this issue? Uh, just a couple. No, I wasn't counting, but it was it was very fast. <laughs> yeah, I, I think maybe three, four clicks. And, you know, if I wasn't explaining, literally within 30 seconds, we identified a problem, you know, and drilled down into what was causing the problem. This guy is running VLC. Uh, let's let's take another look at another problem here. Uh, I noticed when we were uh, go back one more uh, user sessions. I noted noticed another session was um, had some high uh, CPU usage. Um, we have uh, Alex Alex R who uh, has a high uh, uh, stress level and. To find out what, I'm just going to go ahead and click this sessions processes. Boom, we're there. Show, looks like uh, Alexar is doing little chia farming um, there, which we, again, probably not something that we, we want going on and something that we need to investigate. You know, two clicks, boom, we're there. So that's our web based console. Uh, we also have the, the, uh, real-time console. This is a native console. It runs on a Windows machine, whereas the web-based console you can access literally from anywhere that has network connectivity. Uh, this one's running on a machine, uh, running native, so uh, so a little bit different there. And right now I'm looking at the hosts on in in this Pacific Northwest lab. Looks like I have some that are, are pretty stressed. 
we can take thing, look at things like hosts and storage, uh, get an overview of that. But what we really focus in on are uh, VDI sessions, our EUC sessions. Have this folder here that has my two, two connection servers in it, my two environments. I have a Horizon 7 and a Horizon 8 environment. Go ahead and click on the connection server, see how it's doing. Um, and if you have multiple connection servers, it'll list them here. But overall, it looks like everything's going pretty good. Um, yeah, no, no real issues here. And let's uh, go ahead and dive down into a pool. I have three pools here. Uh, and um, one of the machines here uh, is highly stressed. Um, and again, I'm just going to kind of take a look and see what's going on here. So I can go ahead and take a look at this and see why it's stressed. Uh, it has a lot of memory utilization, has a lot of page files going on in it. Uh, CPU, 40%. So I can see that one of my machines is um, highly stressed here. Let me go ahead and take a look at the sessions. This brings up all the sessions. Here's the two that we saw uh, previously. Let me go ahead and take a look at this one that's owned by Alex R. And we can see that he is running um, a Chia. So I'm going to go ahead and send him a note saying, you know, is this something you should be doing? Blah, blah, blah. He'll come back with me. This will display on his screen. And uh, maybe I just want to say, you know, this really isn't something you should be doing. And I'm going to go ahead and end the process, kill the process. Or maybe it's something we want to do, but we don't want to take up a lot of resources. So I can uh, set the um, uh, uh, process priority. And maybe I just want to send it to, you know, um, um, below normal and take care of it that way. Or like I said, I can just uh, kill it outright. Um, there we go. We can also go to the machines view, take a look at it and just say, no, we, we don't want these processes running on them. And so I can set a policy to uh, say, uh, disable process ex execution. When Chia, when someone tries to start Chia, it's gonna say Chia is not allowed to run. There we go. Um, so again, just in a few clicks, I was able to discover an issue, um, stop the issue, and then prevent the issue from reoccurring. Another thing I want to show you that's kind of neat and kind of unique to, to us is we can also do things like examine the file systems. So here I have six different uh, virtual desktops, and I'm looking at the file systems on all those machines and uh, doing a comparison of them. And so it looks like everything's the same, except for I have one config.msi that is on some of the machines, uh, but not all of the machines. So that's a neat way you can uh, take a look at a bunch of machines at the same time and figure out what's different. We can do the same with programs and updates. The ones in purple indicate that exist on one machine, but not uh, other machines. Uh, so we have the VLC media player on this machine, the uh, A2 machine. Um, the ones in green show that exist on some machines, but not all the machines, a Zoom client. So if I need to go there and install a, a Zoom client, we can also do this with um, the Windows uh, programs as well, updates. Uh, let's see, and the registry. Registry is kind of a, a constant headache for everyone trying to figure out, you know, if I have two machines, one's working and one's not working, you know, sometimes it has to do with stuff in the registry. And so I can see that, uh, you know, this has a Mozilla plugin in the, in the registry um, on one machine that um, isn't on the, any of the other machines. So kind of cool stuff. Um, so, now I want to take us to a little bit different environment. I'm not sure that you guys have had a chance to work with Test Drive, but it's something that I use all the time. I really like using it. It's set up by VMware, um, and you can get access to it. And it gives you a way to work with either VMware products or uh, their partner products like ControlUp uh, with a real hands-on environment. 
And what I want to do here is uh, log on duration. Trent, you know, we were talking about a log on duration, how it'll kill you uh, if, if, if you aren't careful. Um, and so what we do is we go out there, we take a look at uh, the log on duration, uh, average app load times. We uh, get a bunch of this, of this dis diff information. And we can even go further than that. We have script actions. What they just do is they go in there and they perform uh, a script on a virtual desktop, gather information, display it, or it can do other things. It can kill process, it can do a lot of really neat things. And you're going to be talking a lot more about scripts, aren't you, uh, Trent? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. yeah. So this one, I'm going to go ahead and analyze, lo analyze log and duration. What it's going to do is go out there to the virtual machine, gather all these logs, kind of coordinate the various activities, and then report back on why people are doing the log on duration. Um, we have app volumes in this now, right? Didn't you write that for uh, this script, Trent? Yep, that's right. So we do track how long it takes app volumes to attach. And this is especially important with uh, app volumes if you have it set to attach applications synchronously. But even if you have them attached asynchronously, it's still a phase within. Yeah, and so you can see it perfectly right there. Yes, if we have app volumes, we do track how long it takes to, to mount them. And if they're blocking the logon process, how long it took the, the phase to finish. Excellent. Yeah, and we also do things with group policies. Uh, you were telling me about just some people write some really interesting group policies that maybe they don't realize how long they're taking, right? Yeah, there's, yeah, group policy is a beast. It's got features and those features can cause delays because of just how Windows works and things like that. So this script here actually really helps in identifying it. And we've been working really hard on growing it. So that way it encompasses as many features as possible and as many technologies that we can track. For instance, like you're showing here, the VMware uh, Dynamic Environment Manager, we actually track how long that phase took. Um, because you can have options within the VMware Dynamic Environment Manager that might have a, you know, a decremental effect to your logon performance. So um, we can help identify that that phase was causing the delay. Yep. In this case, it looks like someone was uh, mapping a drive, and and right down here at the bottom, we we kind of say exactly what what happened, and you know how how much time is spent. Um, gives the sys admin you know, an idea where to go look and, and solve these, these problems. So um, neat stuff. Um, so let me go ahead and turn it over to you. I think you're going to talk about, um, are you going to talk about um, automated actions now? Yeah, so I'm going to get into some automated actions and some of the other features of Control Up, just something that we think we'd like to highlight. Uh, so now that we've switched over, we can see my screen. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at all the sessions within uh, our control up horizon environment. Um, and where I would like to start actually is uh, on some of our, our new features. Um, so we've got this new feature called remote DX and uh, it's part of our last mile. And what we can do with it is we can, we've got all these new columns that, that show you uh, all the remote connections, all the statistics and, and metadata that we're collecting from remote connections. So in this particular one, you know, I've got uh, these users here. We can see what their Wi-Fi signal strength is. We can see what their LAN latency is. We can see their total session latency. So that's, we've implemented our own ping solution within the virtual channel that we enable for remote DX. And so as we ping from your endpoint to your session, we're actually tracking how long that is. So this is essentially the same thing you see with uh, the protocol latency metric within Horizon. Um, and then we've got internet latency. So this is the, the ping to a known source. So this is 8.8.8.8. So the Google DNS server. So no matter where you are in the world, if you're having a ping and you're going to those Google DNS servers, you might have a bad route. And we can actually identify that. So we've got two, um, connections here, and we can see the land latency on this first one is 205 milliseconds, but the total session latency is 170. So that's quite good considering the first hop is 205 milliseconds. And the internet latency is 241. So that makes some sense that the land latency would be adding on on top of that. So this should be about 200 milliseconds less um, 
if it was not in a unhealthy state. So when we start looking at these metrics and we start thinking about those 15,000 home offices or whatever, um, we can now get some inside information as to how those devices are performing. And so we obviously, like I said, Wi-Fi signal strength, land latency, uh, session latency, and internet latency. We also track packet loss. So if your device or if your um, uh, access point is having some kind of health issues, it might be generating packet loss. We're able to track that as well. And then what we can see here is the metadata. So again, scrolling over, we can see uh, we've got the Wi-Fi, uh, NIC connectivity, the client NICs, whether they're wireless or Ethernet, the public IP address that everyone's connecting from, their local router IP, and the Wi-Fi SSID. So what's really interesting about this information here is that we can see I'm connected to the same network, T-Home 2, but I'm connected to two different devices. So I am having so this, health issues. So this is kind of like a mesh network? Yes, this is a mesh network, or potentially right. just two access points configured with the same SSID. Um, in my particular case, it is a mesh network. And so what I find really interesting here is I've got one device that's sick and it's connected to this device. And I've got another device that's healthy and it's connected to this device. So immediately I can make a, a determination as to what's going on with this device. You know, is it sick because it's the device or is it sick because it's the Wi-Fi network or the access point it's connected to? You know, consumer access points, they're really feature rich today, right? They, they provide a lot of functions. You can run a, like a Plex Media server off of it. You can run a NAS for your backups off of it. Um, you can run BitTorrent off of like half of them and, and so on and so forth. They they're just have a lot of really rich features, but those features can have an impact to you. Um, so in this particular case, we can see this one Wi-Fi access device looks like it might be causing our LAN latency or our high latency, giving this user a poor user experience. Um, potentially what I could do is I can ask this user, hey, can you connect to a different Wi-Fi device? Can you find which access point this is and maybe just shut it down and let's connect to the other one and see if your problems persist. Um, but at least I'm actually doing real troubleshooting uh, as opposed to just guess and test if you were completely blind, right? If you're completely blind to this information, you might send them a new laptop. You might ask them to upgrade their internet service provider connection. You might ask them maybe to buy a new access point, but it doesn't matter because they're still connecting to the old access point because it's a, a mesh network or they have the same SSID or something. We actually have the capability now with Remote DX of actually seeing all of this information and giving you those that information to actually make informed decisions as to what you're gonna do. Um, so I'm actually a little bit curious as to what these devices are because you can see the the hardware addresses are, are a bit different so i'm just curious if it's the same device or if i actually have different devices and so what i'm going to show is actually adding a script action to control up and then actually adding it to the ui here so this way you can actually see how control up can the interface is super malleable and you can actually modify it in such a way to help increase your troubleshooting efficiency so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna to go to my script actions here and I'm gonna to go to my drafts and I'm gonna import uh, this script action written by uh, the great Marcel Kalev. And so this is awesome Wi-Fi vendor from the Wi-Fi BSSID. So this is gonna take the BSSID and it's gonna tell me who the manufacturer is. So I'm gonna finalize it so that way I can use it. So I'm gonna to go to the virtual expert here and I'm gonna to go to the script action rules and I'm gonna to go to the sessions view because that's the view I was on. I was on the sessions view here. And so now my source view is sessions. I'm gonna add a new uh, attachment to a column. And that column, I want to be the Wi-Fi BSSID. And I'm gonna add a filter here. So I only want this script to show up if it so happens that that field is populated. So if I go to Wi-Fi BSSID and it can be populated with anything, just not nothing. So there we go, and I'm gonna run a script action. I'm gonna choose that script action we have prepared. Wi-Fi vendor from the Wi-Fi wi BSSID. Awesome, let's hit apply. And now what's gonna happen, we're gonna see a menu icon up here. So once I hit okay here, we can see now there's a new menu icon attached to these devices. So if I click on it, I can now get the recommended action to run this script. And so now it's running against this user. So it sees that I'm connected on, on this particular user. I'm connected to a D-Link device. 
Uh, let's run it again here, and let's run it again here, and let's go back to the results window. All right, so what do I got? So I've got two Asetek devices. So potentially, well, actually, I, I know I've got two Wi-Fi routers. One's a new one, one's an old one. That's why the Mac prefix is a little bit different. They're both Asetek. Uh, obviously, it looks like they've changed it over time, or perhaps two different divisions have applied for different Mac prefixes. Either way, I know that they're uh, Asetek devices as opposed to D-Link, which is what my third session is connected to. So that's a way that we can modify control up and change the interface and make it really malleable and really tailored for your environment and for the solutions that you have. So this way you don't have to right click and go hunting through scripts. We can actually attach them to the individual columns and those objects themselves just by clicking on them. So super cool. But now I wanna get into some of the automation stuff and I wanna tie in the automation to uh, Remote DX and how this all operates. But before I do, I wanna show uh, some automations that we've come up with that I think are super cool and I think you guys are really going to like them. So first thing I'm going to do is I just want to focus on my RDS machine here. And I'm going to just RDP into it just as you can imagine that this is just like any other Horizon session. All right, cool. So I've got this new session on here and it should pop up. There we go. Uh, so we can see it's this guy. So if I'm looking at this particular session, what we have is we have a series of automations that allows us to automate the optimization of resources in your environment. You know, if you're hosting RDS sessions on Horizon, these are multi-session machines that can have multiple users on them. Uh, essentially what you're introducing is contention. These users are gonna be asking for CPU and memory um, for their applications, for whatever tasks that they happen to be doing. And the challenge is what happens if they're not being productive? What if they walk away? What if they're going to a doctor's appointment for like three or four hours? What if they're going for lunch? What if they, they just walked away from the session and just left it, right? So there's two phases of unproductivity there. There's an idle session and there's a disconnected session. So a disconnected session, uh, you know, a user's walked away and then it idles out and then it, it goes into a disconnected state. So that way, if you were to come back, they could reconnect in fairly quickly. The challenge with a disconnected session is that they're consuming a lot of resources. They've got all these processes running. They're consuming a whole bunch of memory, um, but they're not being productive. So this is taking away resources from other users on the machine, especially when you start talking about CPU cycles. CPU contention is so important. And when we're talking about memory contention as well, it's also another really important one where you don't want to be hitting the page file or you want to be hitting the page file as, as unfrequently as possible. So what we're going to do is uh, I've got these two actions that will pick up on the state of the session. We can see that the session is active. And so I'm going to right click and I'm just going to disconnect this session. So again, we can do all this within control up super easy. Control is going to pick up that the session state has been moved to disconnected because it's a real time console. We pick up on that stuff immediately. And what it's going to do is going to do two actions. One, it's going to reduce the process priority of all of these processes or any processes uh, excluding certain processes. And then the other, it's going to trim the memory working set. So we can see that memory working sets. Boom, we can see the processes just changed. Now the memory is at 500 megabytes. Once this memory gets trimmed, boom, 20 megabytes. We can see the impact across all the processes within this user session. Um, so now we are freeing up resources for other users on that machine. And we can do this in two steps. We can do this when a session is idle, or we can do it when it's in a disconnected state. Uh, so what happens when a user comes back? So say they went to a doctor's appointment, came back, and they want to hop back on. So we are going to RDP back to this guy. And again, this is simulating a Horizon session getting reconnected. And boom, we can see that the memory working set will increase automatically. We'll see the session state gets changed to active. And the memory working set, we're just letting Windows do its own paging in and out of memory. But we'll see the process parties all get turned back to what they were previously. So uh, it just takes a couple seconds for it to activate because it's just picking up on the state change. And then once that happens, boom, just just like that, real time, right? We can see these activities working in real time. Uh, so this user is back to being productive. Their share of resources is the same or, or um, same as what they had before. They're not losing any performance. We're just reducing their resource impact when they're not being productive. Good stuff. Uh, so I wanna show another optimization technique. So this is another thing that I'm, I'm really excited about. 
Uh, so I'm just going to go back and focus on the horizon here and I want to find my session and my session is this guy. And I'm going to again switch back to the active idle column preset that I have. And so what we have here is I've got this user who is using um, Adobe Acrobat Reader and he's got a 3D model uh, built in. So obviously Adobe, it, Adobe Reader's expanded out its functionality big time and one of them is the ability to embed 3D models. Well, this session is not a 3D session. So let me just switch over to my guy here. There's no 3D capabilities within the software. So manipulating this model is going to be painful. It's all gonna be generated in software. So as I'm manipulating the model, we can see the user input delay goes up. And what I've done is I've created an automation that will adjust the process priority, giving it just that little bit more CPU cycles uh, over top of everything else in the system when it detects the user input delay is, is over top of a certain threshold. Um, I believe that threshold is like, I set it for 200 milliseconds, but we'll see in a sec. Boom. And so we can see that the Adobe Acrobat Reader is now above normal. So how cool is that? We've now done something based on uh, user response. So what user input delay is, is it actually measures the responsiveness of the UI. So as I'm mousing over this menu here, and you can see the highlight is trying to catch up to the mouse, it is measuring that. It is measuring when the mouse moves from one field to another that this highlight needs to change from here to here and how long that takes, that's what it's measuring. So that's super, super cool. You can do it to almost any application on any Windows-based application that just uses the Windows UI. Um, it picks up on all of that. So we have that built into control up, uh, you know, all the way from the processes view to the sessions view to the machines view. It shows the user input delay, either as the aggregate of the machines view of the users underneath or of the session showing you the highest user input delay on that particular session. And with active application, we're able to actually identify which application the user is using that is generating that user input delay. So super cool feature, really, really powerful. Yeah, and this this automation, you know, like we mentioned, we got, you know, so many people out there and we just don't have the time to, to go in and, and do each one manually. We need to automate. I mean, automate, automate, automate. And didn't Steve Jobs say that? Was that Steve Ballmer? <laughs> on me, on me. Yeah, I think that was Steve Ballmer. <laughs> uh, so another thing I want to show. So we have this other automation. Again, it's out of the box. You can just hit the checkbox and checkbox and just enable it. Is we have this automation that you can see the free space on the system drive here. We can detect free space, and once it crosses a threshold, we can actually take an action to correct it. So I'm going to take. I'm going to take this guy because I don't think anyone's on him. And I've got this demo script here that all it does is it just fills the temp folder with uh, a file as big as it can. So I'm going to say 18 gigs. Um, obviously, there's only 2.9 available, so this should spit out some errors. There we go. And what we'll do is we'll see, boom, the free space on the system drive changed. So control, again, being a real-time console, real-time product, it's got a cause and effect. And we've got this trigger that will pick up on the free space being less than some value and it will it'll clean it up it'll run the the windows cleanup utility um it'll just empty out boom you can see it just fixed all, all that for you it'll just clean out any temp folders that it's aware of and just clear up that free space so if you've got you know I, i've worked with applications that um when you're using them they download files so they download like images or something like that uh, especially like i think um PAX viewers are particularly bad with this. They download them and they cache them in, in like the temp directory and they never delete them just in case you happen to go back to them because it takes time to do that download and they want to be as fast as possible. Well, that consumes a lot of free space. So with this, we can automatically detect when free spaces hit a certain thing and then we can do an action on that. Uh, so I'm going to focus on my sessions again and I'm going to choose my remote DX users. And so I've got several remote DX users here. I've got three of them. And we did notice that, uh, you know, we've got poor Wi-Fi on a few of them. Um, we can see that the, out of the Wi-Fi access points, the metadata is telling me that one of them is connected to an open access point. And obviously this is really concerning because open access points, 
anyone could be anyone who's connected on the same network can snoop on all of your traffic. It's it's not secure in any way, shape, or form. So if you're in a coffee shop or something like that, um, and you're connecting into say like Horizon or your resources, someone else who's connected to that same Wi-Fi access point could be capturing all that traffic, and then automatically, um, you know, getting things like. Uh, uh, your password and stuff out of it because it's all over clear text until it's over SSL. But if you do capture the SSL negotiation, I mean, it's just, it's just a nightmare. Anyway, so what we can do is we've tied some automations to these metadata properties and we can then execute actions on them automatically for you. So for instance, on this particular one, it's an open access point. What we want to do is we want to alert the user that they've connected to an open access point and potentially log them off. Right? So first thing we'll do is send them a message. The second thing we'll do is log them off. So I'm looking at this one particular user here and he's connected to uh, a Windows 8 machine. So what I'm gonna do is just get a session screenshot. All right, so this is the user. And what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna simulate that he's reconnected to the Wi-Fi network. Uh, so once he's reconnected to the Wi-Fi network, he is going to get this message. So once he's connected in, remote DX is kicked in, control up is gonna be like, um, it's gonna detect that the uh, Wi-Fi authentication is open and boom, he's gonna get a message. And so you can see down in the corner here, we've got this script action that generates these message windows. So in this particular one, it tells us insecure Wi-Fi IP detected. An insecure Wi-Fi access point was detected. Authentication type open, please connect it to an encrypted AP. And if we wanted to, we could change this text so it says something else. Um, we can also attach another action to this trigger. So that way it automatically logs the user off after 60 seconds or something like that. So how do we do that? So first I'm gonna look at the trigger and then we'll look at the script and modifying the script. So here's the trigger. Uh, right here, notify user when an unsecured Wi-Fi access point. Um, so it's a session object, because that's what remote DX is. We've got these two states. Is the authentication open or is it none? And those stars around mean wildcard, so any text before or after these two words. And if that happens to be true, we run the action, notify user when an open Wi-Fi access point is being used. So super simple. Now, what does the script look like? All right, so notify when using an open Wi-Fi AP. Um, again, we're looking at a session is running in the user session, not the target machine. And the reason why it's running in the user session is because it generates a UI. Uh, if you run in the target machine, it's going to generate the UI under the system account, which doesn't have UI, so it doesn't do anything. But if we run it under the user session, it actually executes as that user. And so here's what the script looks like. So again, this was written by, I think, the, the uh, great guy Leach. And it creates a the window that you just saw. He's added a whole bunch of properties to customize this and make it how, however you want. If you want to make it really gaudy and have a red background with white text, you can do that. And so here's all the different options that we're offering for this particular script action. So this is super awesome. We choose what metric we want. We do that by having this client metric, and then this is the metric that we choose to pass through. So we chose that uh, Wi-Fi authentication field. If we wanted to, we can change this field to be something else, and it'll pass that in the message. So then for the message itself, this is what it looks like. I'll actually copy and paste this out into a notepad window. All right, cool. So this is what we're looking at. So Wi-Fi a insecure Wi-Fi access point was detected, authentication type this. So this parameter will get replaced by the session parameter here. Um, please connect to an encrypted access point. So I'll change this to the exclamation mark. Um, please, this is important. So I'm gonna copy this in and I'm gonna edit this message and let's just paste it in over top. Okay, cool. And again, we can change the title. We can change the percentage of the screen it covers. We can change the background color, the text color, fonts. We can have it time out after so many seconds. Um, you know, super cool stuff. So let's do that. And now let's just take a look. I'll finalize it. All right, so then boom, that's how we modify the Wi-Fi, the open access Wi-Fi. So we're gonna try another one. So we're gonna look at more triggers that we have. So we've got more notification type triggers because 
these fields are metadata, so they're providing us additional information. So another thing we can do is notify when a user has poor Wi-Fi. And so what we do here is we look at the session and we look at uh, the Wi-Fi signal strength. So in this particular case, we're looking at is it less than 75% and is it greater than or equal to 1%. So as long as this criteria is met, we will fire this message, notify user when poor Wi-Fi is detected. And then lastly, we've also got this other one, notify user when an insecure or older OS is detected. So obviously when you're talking home offices, people can be running you know, anything. They could be running you know, Windows XP potentially. I don't think you can get on the internet anymore with Windows XP, but um, you know, they could be running older operating systems like Vista, Windows 8, you know, so on and so forth. And so what we can do here is we've developed this trigger to actually list out all the operating systems that are unsupported. So we've got, you know, is it XP? Hopefully not. Uh, is it Vista, Windows 7, Windows 8? And is the client OS name, is it a Mac? Is it Mac OS? And is this collection true? So these are all the versions of the unsupported Mac operating system. Uh, so if, if you're running a version of the unsupported Mac OS, you will get another notification. Um, and then the same is true for Windows. So we're looking for, is it not the long-term servicing branch or the long-term servicing channel? And is the client name Windows 10? And is this collection true? So these are all older versions, older build numbers of the Windows 10 um, operating system. So all of these are unsupported at this point. And if any of this matches is true, then you are going to get a message. So it needs to be true for at least 30 seconds. So these messages just aren't popping up like crazy. They'll just kind of stack as time kind of goes along. Um, so notify user when an insecure older OS is detected. So what does that look like? So I'm gonna go back to my session here. All right, and we'll enable auto refresh. All right, so when this connects, when this session connects in and it's been connected in for 30 seconds, boom, this is what the user gets. Uh, they'll get this message. Your client operating system is out of date. Windows. Microsoft Windows 8.1 is out of date. Please apply updates to secure your device. In this particular case, what we can do is we can actually take this trigger and we don't want someone who's got an unsecure operating system connected into our environment. If you're doing something like drive sharing or drive mapping or anything like that through Horizon, uh, you know, an infected device now has a channel to actually send files to your servers in the data center. And so what we can do, instead of just notifying them, we can also add an additional action. We're gonna run an action and we're gonna run log off session. Super simple. So hit okay. Now, when someone with an insecure or older operating system is detected, it will notify them and then log them off. Boom, just like that, super simple. And so we can attach that to, to any of these, super easy. Um, you know, amazing capabilities that we offer here. Yeah, you know, this is so important where people bring their own devices. We need we need we need to make sure that they're not gonna hit us with ransomware, things like that, right? That's right. Yeah. All right, Tom. So I'm gonna actually hand this back to you now. All right, great. Um, what I want to talk about before we uh, get talking, take this little guy and, and have some fun with it with remote DX. Um, is I want to talk about, we have these resources, we need to make sure they're available on the network. You know, what, what, what good is it if someone tries to connect to a virtual desktop and the virtual desktop just isn't reachable through the network? So what we have is a synthetic monitoring, it's called Scout Bees. It goes out there and tries to get a network resource. Um, you, can, you can get these resources. We, it all runs in the cloud. It's a totally uh, SaaS thing. You don't need to install anything on your premise. Um, it just goes out there and monitors it. So what we're looking at here is the portal there, the dashboard for it. I'm looking at all types of the tests that we have set up. Um, and I'm gonna kind of scope in just on the EUC. Um, and we have two EUC tests set up. One is for the Horizon CU console. Um, this is in test drive. And so that's what we were looking at before the real-time console. We're obviously concerned. We want people to be able to access that. So we do monitor it. And we also have a, a desktop out there that we're monitoring as well. Uh, we're actually doing pretty good. 97% for the console, 100% in the last 24 hours. 
for the desktop. I'm going to go ahead and look over the past five days, still at 99% uh, percent for the console. Well, let's go ahead and take a look over the last, oh, let's say three months or so. So I'm going to pick June 1st through uh, uh, September 30th, say apply. And um, we uh, definitely um, see, see a little bit less. And what I'm going to do is go ahead and uh, click into the CU console. And it tells us the failure rates, um, you know, when, when they failed, um, how many have failed in this time period. Looks like we have 56 failed. I'm gonna go ahead and dive in those a little bit more. It tells us the exact time that they failed. Then if we dive into that a little bit more, it tells why it uh, failed. It could be that it um, timed out, uh, that it took longer to response than we wanted to, or in this case, it couldn't connect at all to the uh, published resort. A resource. And these are super simple to set up. I'm going to go ahead and go here, um, create a scout. We have um, hives. It, so we have a bunch of different clouds throughout the, uh, throughout the world that you can choose to use. Um, I'm going to go ahead and protect uh, Virginia. I'm going to go ahead and use the Horizon UAG. I'm um, going to use test drive with our domain. There we go. I set this all up before. And what's neat about this is it goes out there and it gets the resources. These are all the published resources. And then we can choose which one we want to, to uh, monitor. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, pick this uh, Acrobat Reader. And then how often we want it to run, five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes, uh, give it a name. And then we can do um, things. We want it to report session timeout, you know, 120 minutes if, or 120 seconds. If it can't get to it, um, then that's a session timeout. A connection timeout, you know, 60 seconds. And then I'm going to go ahead and put in a demo uh, scout. Oh. <laughs> All right, there. I'm going to uh, pick five minutes for it to run, and then the alert pol policy. Uh, uh, you know, if if it's equal to, not equal to, if the authentication duration, connection, total time to session ready, a uh, server name is equal to um, whatever we want it to do, and then whether we want to have a email sent to us or add a, heb a webhook method. And then, um, or we can link to, to third party integration as well. So super simple to set up uh, and it saves the help desk um, from getting a bunch of calls from users saying, hey, this resource isn't available. Is it me or is it the resource? So it, uh, it really makes it simple. And so that's Scout Bees. And now I'm gonna pass it back to Tom to do what? Well, let's let the remote DX. It's such a cool technology. Let's show them how it works in action. So I have my boss's laptop here, like I said, and what we're going to do, I had to install remote DX on it, a few other applications, Zoom and stuff like that. So let's see how, you know, everyday um, activities <laughs> uh, affect it. Does that sound good? You got remote DX up there and are you looking at it? Hold on. Did you say everyday activities? Do you normally <laughs> microwave a laptop? No, I said I was going to stick in the microwave. But I, 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 I like the cut of your jib there. I kind of like <laughs> where you're going with this. You know, it's, it's the boss's, right? It, it is the boss's laptop. Are you sure? <laughs> like, oh, well, you know, Tom, there's actually something I'm really curious about. So the, the laptop itself, when it... When it's in a microwave, a microwave blocks 2.4 gigahertz radio waves. Well, Wi-Fi operates off of 2.4 gigahertz. It, you know, back in the day, whenever we'd cook something, our reception would just go to just just disappear. So that's why, because it was on the same kind of gigahertz -y channel. Yeah, it, well, 2.4 gigahertz. Yeah, yeah, it's a okay. big spectrum, right? And microwaves operate off of it and... Laptops operate. Okay, let's let's do a couple things. Um, 
first I'll, I'll just turn on the microwave and see if I'm getting any leakage from the microwave. This is a expensive microwave leak, leak detector. <laughs> okay. And then, then we'll kind of throw it in the microwave and see how that works. And then maybe wrap it with aluminum foil and then wrap it in aluminum foil and stick it in the microwave and then kind of go from there. Is that right? Well, I think this sounds crazy, but I'm interested to see it. So okay. <laughs> let's do it. All right. So let's see. What was the first thing? Oh, I'm going to just turn on the microwave. Just do a quick blast here. Yeah. 30 seconds or something. Just oh. give it some, some time. Okay. There we go. All right. So I'm monitoring your Wi-Fi signal. You said the microwave is going. Yeah, 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 yeah. I set it on a popcorn setting. Is right. is, so that the, is that the best one? You shouldn't you shouldn't have any Wi-Fi signal if the microwave is properly shielded, which it's supposed to be. And yeah, yeah, yeah. I tell you right now, the Wi-Fi signal strength is a solid ninety-eight percent. So I think you're I think you're good. It looks like the microwave is doing a good job of holding it together. Okay. I uh, you know what? I'm gonna turn on my camera here on my other laptop so we can kind of record this. Does that sound good? That sounds good. Video. There we go. Video recording. All right. All right. Now I'm going to, can you still see it? Is my laptop in the way? No, it's perfect. All right. So one laptop, let's make sure I get the right laptop in there. I hate to do it to my own. <laughs> okay. So. All right. So you've just closed the microwave, right? So now yep. that la laptop is in an enclosed, essentially a, like a Faraday cage that's supposed to be blocking any 2.4 gigahertz signals from leaking out. Um, I'm sure it's not perfect, so it probably does leak some. Hey, you know what, Tom? The Wi-Fi Wait. signal just dropped. It just dropped in real time. I literally just What's watched it, it in real time. That's down to 59% now. Okay, so cool, 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 cool. The, the microwave is literally blocking the 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, which is what it's supposed to do. I find it amazing that we're getting signal strength at all, but amazingly we are. That's so cool. Okay. And you've just hey, microwave back up, hey? Yeah. Oh, and what are we getting now? Uh, let's give it a few seconds to refresh. I'm not sure how often Windows refreshes the signal strength. So Remote DX, if it's reading it from Windows, it might take a second or so. Boom, we're back up to 100%. That's incredible. All right. All right. All right. Um, so I'm, I, I got some tinfoil here. I'm going to put some tin foil on it see if you know because i know <laughs> <laughs> oftentimes i wear a tin, these are these are for my tin foil hat so i know they're good right yeah <laughs> and I, I see you've removed all your hair to stop that <laughs> anything well, transferring. yeah you know when i said way back when when i had the old microwave and it killed it that's when i started losing my hair after <laughs> <think> maybe then <laughs> okay. we're, we're at a hundred percent it the, the foil has done nothing what happens if you put it in the microwave now in the microwave with the foil on it well i'm just curious if we get any lower than 59. okay like this yeah see if that does it okay getting anything uh let's give it a couple seconds here like everything it's okay. dependent on the update speed of windows so okay. still sitting at 100 but uh now we're down to 67 so looking pretty good let's give it one more update here i think that'll be like three or four seconds so 67 so maybe the the Let's uh, nuke aluminum. it. Let's maybe, nuke it. Let's well, nuke it. Maybe the aluminum foil is helping. <laughs> oh, let's nuke it. Let's do it. Um, I'm excited about this. Come on. Uh, so, so, okay. <laughs> so, 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 what do you think? Popcorn, frozen entree, <laughs> fresh vegetables. It's uh, got to be popcorn. Time. It's got to be popcorn. Popcorn. Should we do this? Hit it. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, Let's see what's going to happen here. What's happening? Looks like it's glowing in there. We still have connectivity. Oh, I should have turned on. The, wait, I see a few sparks. You see the sparks? Uh, a little bit. It's it's making sound. It's it's still at sixty seven percent. We we still have. You know, well, maybe the session's dead now. I'm not sure. <laughs> it's making a sound. <laughs> Can you hear that? Here, let me hold the mic. Up it's to at sixty four percent. It's still working. Can you hear that? <laughs> no. Oh, man. I'm getting a, a funky odor. <laughs> Maybe. Still. Is, are, you, are, you, are you still are you still getting it? I, 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 still? Yeah, I'm getting updates. Internet latency. No way. Itself. Oh wait, yeah. I saw another flash. Okay, wait, wait, wait. All right, hold on. That is a well-grounded laptop. 
Oh, oh, my fire fire detector's going. Off. <laughs> okay, <laughs> stop it, stop it. We don't want you. No way, no way. We're just here. Okay, all right. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> how do I stop this thing? <laughs> open the door. That's how you stop it. No, no, okay, I'm gonna open it up. Oh, look at that. Can you oh, see the smoke? Oh, it's dead. It's dead. It went disconnected. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna let it cool off. Let's let's uh, let's talk about the <laughs> wait wait yeah. Let's talk about control up now. People can can uh, get control up. How does that <laughs> does that sound? Let's, then I'll yeah, pull it let's out. talk about how people can get control up. So first yeah, off, yeah. I'm super impressed that it was able to hold getting electrically bashed by microwave Ooh, radiation man. for at least I a little. Got a window. Bit. <laughs> Sorry, that thing stinks. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go, oh. go ahead and uh, talk to you about the control up architecture. <laughs> I'm going to open up the window here. <laughs> sure. So what's really cool about control up is how it's architected, essentially. You know, you, you can download a portable application right off of our website. Or if you go to myvmware.com and you, you download it off of there, it's the exact same thing. You get the exact same portable ac application, uh, which means you can run it anywhere. You can put it on a file share, double click it. You can put it on a USB thumb drive, plug it into different machines, and boom, you've got this really really cool uh, application that you monitors essentially your entire environment so the complexity of the architecture diagram is significantly reduced from the end user perspective so we are really proud of that um, and then yeah any information uh, within control gets uploaded to the control up cloud for both the solve uh, data display or for control up insights we connect into uh, you know your d different data sources that tom alluded to earlier through API calls. So we connect into both uh, vCenter and Horizon through API calls. Um, yeah, and then from there, that's how we present everything within Control Up. So that's the architecture in a nutshell. Very, very simple, very cool. Right, and let's see, they can go to myvmware.com to download it, right? Did you, did you talk to them about this? <laughs> I was distracted a little bit. <laughs> no, I, I touched on a little bit, but yeah, you can go to myvmware.com um, you know, you put in your information, you, you can download it right there with myvmware.com. You get a 90 day trial of control up. So you get a, a good amount of time to run through a POC and make sure that it's what we're hoping, uh, is delivering value in your environment. And we, we confidently think that it will deliver you quite a bit of value. So really, really strongly recommend you go to myvmware.com, download control up, or I think it's called the, uh, advanced monitoring for horizon and then uh when, once you download that and you double click the exe boom there, there you go you got this really cool uh product you just start adding your resources to it and then you can see what what kind of real-time metrics we offer and then what kind of remediation or actions you can do in your environment yeah yep and you know within an hour they'll have actionable items they can tell whether their their laptops have been nuked or not um <laughs> He was supposed to just simulate going into like a, a shielded <laughs> stairwell. <laughs> <laughs> well, this this is better. Um, let's see. And if they need support, they can either get. We have a couple of really sharp VMware SEs out there that that can definitely help you out if you have any issues. I think they can reach out to us directly to. But I mean, it's pretty pretty straightforward to install. And we got a bunch of videos to walk people through it as well, right? Absolutely, all available off of our website, either support.controlup.com or off of our YouTube page. All right, let's see. Um, uh, can you can you see can you see that? Are, are, what happened? To, oh my! Oh, <laughs> there we is go. That what the sticker was is that where the the windows? The oh, I bet it was there? genuine. Yeah, yeah, you can see like the little holograph thing, and then the screen there kind of took a hit. Oh, stuff. I, you know, I I am gonna send it to the boss. Um, should we nuke it for another? 30 seconds you think but i think it's had enough <laughs> no i'm getting out this was a this was a, a crap top it just gave me nothing but grief so we're gonna we're gonna nuke it oh my. put that little bad boy in there all right and i'm gonna go for a quick 30 seconds oh okay well, do you have a kill extinguisher handy do you have something close by <laughs> <laughs> i got a window i can jump out of real quick <laughs> you know i thought it'd be sparking more better no, it's smoking. Ah, uh, you know. Oh, oh wait, there it goes. There it oh, goes. There it goes. There it goes. Go. Oh, it's on fire! Oh. <laughs> oh man, that's plasma. Where's that fire extinguisher? Oh, jeez. What are you doing? Hey, 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 hey! I, I, I gotta go, Trent. Uh, great presentation. Hope people enjoyed it. Uh, I'm gonna open this real quick, but oh yeah, I got an issue here. Okay. okay. <laughs> Stop. Okay. Right. Hey, hey, guys. Thanks for. I hope you enjoyed the session. All right.
Thanks, everyone. I got to go. Bye. Bye.